during the early decades of the first century. The holy scriptures the Christian church used was the Old Testament. In most cases, it was the Old Testament as presented in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew manuscripts. Years were passing, and the church was growing rapidly with an incursion of a large Gentile population. These new converts had little understanding of Hebrew law and custom, and strange doctrines began to confuse the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. The early church felt a need to formulate a written account of the teachings of Jesus. The confusion caused by the emergence of several early Christian heresies, especially the Gnostic heresy, caused unrest in the congregations around the empire. The conflict with Gnosticism forced the Orthodox Church to define and clarify which writings were attributed to the first apostles. The apostolic canon would be used to judge other revelations and writings, especially those of the Gnostics. When apostles and early Christians in the first decades of the church spoke of Holy Scripture, they usually meant the Greek version of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. The early church also read and circulated collections of apostolic epistles and gospels. The early church did not intend to compile an authoritative New Testament that would be revered as sacred alongside the Old Testament, but the Gnostics forced the church into such an action. Who are the Gnostics? The Gnostics were a heretical group that claimed to have secret knowledge imparted to them by a particular disciple who alone was the true interpreter of the divine message. Since the accepted collection of apostolic epistles and gospels did not support these Gnostic assertions, these heretical groups were forced to author their own unique gospels nearly 200 years after the ministry of Jesus Christ. Gnostic distortion of the apostolic message forced the Orthodox Church to compile a list of sacred writings. No councils or special conclaves were convened to form a consensus as to which writings would be included in the New Testament canon. The canon process was a slow, gradual acceptance that spanned several centuries. The New Testament canon process used four criteria to judge the books included in the Bible. The first criterion was a consistent message. Does the epistle or gospel contain a theological outlook similar or complementary to other accepted Christian writings? The second criterion was liturgical use of the epistle or gospel in public readings when the early Christian communities gathered for worship services. The third criterion was the universal acceptance of the written work. Was the epistle or gospel acknowledged by all major Christian communities by the end of the fourth century? The fourth and most important criterion was apostolic authorship. Can the writing be attributed to or based on the preaching or teaching of the first generation of apostles. Should a book be included in the canon of the New Testament, it was considered to be of divine inspiration. 
Irenaeus of Lyons, in his work against heresies in the latter second century, insisted that the test of the validity of any inspired writing was whether it was written by the original apostles or men closely connected with them. Tertullian, in the mid-third century, went further when he referred to these writings as the New Testament that he considered equally divinely inspired along with the Old Testament. The canon of the New Testament occurred in three stages. The first stage was the age of the collections. It was a time from the apostles to about 170 AD when the autographs were composed and their value esteemed around the empire. The second stage of the New Testament canon process was the age of the early church fathers. And this age was from the closing years of the second century to the opening of the third century when a large part of the New Testament was seen as sacred and authoritative. The third stage was the age of the final canon, and this age spanned the third and fourth centuries, where the accepted canon of the New Testament was completed in the Eastern and Western churches. We will examine this canonization process in the order of their historic occurrence. We read in the first few verses of Acts chapter 6 that the apostles understood that their responsibility was to give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Clearly, the apostles understood the need to interpret Jesus Christ to a growing church in the light of the Old Testament. The clarifying of the true apostolic tradition is the central root of the New Testament. We see in the New Testament narrative that Peter and Paul equated their apostolic writings with the Old Testament by referring to them as Scripture. The Apostle Paul, in his first epistle to Timothy, quoted both Old and New Testament references as Scripture. We read, For the Scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. The Apostle Paul cited authoritatively Deuteronomy 25.4 and Luke 10.7. The Apostle Peter also regarded Paul's writings as Scripture. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. There can be no doubt that the Apostle Paul wanted his letters to be circulated among the churches for instructional purposes. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Colossians 4.16 After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. 
It was the reading of the epistle of an apostle in public services that began the authorization process of the apostolic writings. The exchange of Christian writings was common among the Christian churches. There are letters written by the late 1st century and early 2nd century bishops making reference to the circulation of Paul's epistles. Polycarp, who was a disciple of John and Bishop of Smyrna, wrote a letter to the Philippians in the first part of the second century. I have received letters from you and from Ignatius. You recommend me to send on yours to Syria. I shall do so either personally or by some other means. In return, I send you the letter of Ignatius, as well as others, which I have in my hands and for which you made request. I add them to the present one. They will serve to edify your faith and perseverance. Ignatius, who was appointed Bishop of Antioch by the Apostle Peter, wrote seven letters that clearly indicate that collections of Pauline epistles and the four Gospels were in circulation among the churches as early as 115 AD. In his epistles, Ignatius freely cites references from Paul's epistles to the Philippians and from the Gospel of Matthew as authoritative. There is also good evidence that Clement of Rome in 95 AD wrote letters to the Christians of Rome where he used material found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The Didache, Greek for the teachings of the Twelve Apostles, is the common name of a brief Christian treaty that was the first Christian instructional manual written about 120 AD. This work cited authoritatively the Pauline epistles and the four Gospels. The same can be said of the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermes in 130 AD that cited authoritatively the Pauline epistles and the four Gospels also. In fact, there are over 36,000 references from the emerging New Testament made by the early bishops and apologists like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Origen, Tertullian, Hippolytus, and Eusebius. The first stage of the canon process was the circulation of these collections of epistles and gospels among the churches. Even though acceptance of certain books does not constitute the complete canon process, it is the first step. The second stage of the canon process spanned the period from 170 AD to 220 AD. It is an age of New Testament canon clarity. Our church fathers sought to identify which books should be included in the canon. Irenaeus, a pupil of Polycarp, accepted the four Gospels, the Book of Acts, Apocalypse, and the Pauline Epistles as authoritative while Tertullian, along with Clement of Alexandria, quoted all four Gospels as Scripture. By the end of the second century, the canon process of the four Gospels and the Pauline Epistles was settled. This fact was established with the discovery of the Muatorian fragment in the Ambrosian Library in Milan in the early 18th century. The traditional date of this text 
is about 170 AD because of its reference to Pius I, Bishop of Rome. The Muatorian Canon contained the following books, four Gospels, the 13 Epistles of Paul and Acts, and the two letters of John, Jude, and the Revelation of John. The canon also contained, with reservation and concerns, the wisdom of Solomon and the revelation of Peter. Even though much of the New Testament was settled, seven books had not yet found a secure place beside the Gospels and Paul in all parts of the church. The Palestinian and Syrian churches for a long time rejected the Apocalypse, while some of the Catholic epistles were considered doubtful in Egypt. The chief difficulty to these disputed books is the silence of the Western Church concerning them. Origen was the most distinguished author of the Eastern Church to address the issue of the disputed books. He argued for the acceptance of Hebrews even though authorship could not be established and Jude. Origen accepted Apocalypse when he wrote this sentence. Therefore, John the son of Zebedee says in the Revelation, but he wavered concerning James, much of 2 Peter and 2 and 3 John. Dionysius of Alexandria was a pupil of Origen. He attributed the Apocalypse to an unknown author named John, not the Apostle John. But he did not doubt its inspiration. He also supported James, 2 John and 3 John, but he did not accept 2 Peter or Jude. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, was the most influential writer of the Western Church. He highly honored the Apocalypse, but he was silent about Hebrews. Cyprian refers to only two of the Catholic epistles, 1 Peter and 1 John. The Western Church accepted the Apocalypse from the beginning, while its position in the Eastern Church was tenuous at best. Conversely, the Epistle to Hebrews was not accepted in the Western Church, while it was considered inspired by the Eastern Church. The third century ended with the disputed books still in question, mired down in church politics. In the West, the five Catholic epistles gained recognition more slowly than in the East. Why were certain books under dispute? Hebrews was doubted because the author was unknown, but it seemed to have apostolic authority. James was doubted for apparent contradiction with Paul's teachings that salvation was by faith alone apart from works. Second Peter was doubted because the style of writing was different than First Peter. Second and Third John were doubted because the author is called Elder, not Apostle. Yet Peter was also called an Elder and an Apostle in First Peter 5.1. Jude was doubted because it referred to two non-canonical books found in the Old Testament Apocrypha, the Book of Enoch and the Assumption of Moses. Revelation was in doubt for its teaching on a thousand-year reign of Christ 
and for its apocalyptic literature. The last stage of the New Testament canon process occurred during the third and fourth centuries. During these centuries, the debate concerning the disputed books came to an end, but it was a slow process. In the West, the five Catholic epistles gained recognition more slowly than in the Eastern Church. In the fourth century, John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, and other bishops argued against including Revelation in the New Testament canon, chiefly because of the difficulties of interpreting it and the danger for abuse. Christians in Syria also rejected the Apocalypse because of the Montantus, an Orthodox extremist sect heavy reliance on it. Gregory of Nazanus and Cyril of Jerusalem published lists omitting Revelation. For a considerable time, the Apocalypse was not accepted by the Eastern Church, especially in the Palestinian and Syrian churches. Clear into the 9th century, the Book of Revelation was disputed by various elements of the Eastern Church. In the end, the Apocalypse was included in the accepted canon, although it remains the only book of the New Testament that is not read within the Divine Liturgy of the Eastern Orthodox Church. During the first part of the 4th century, the question of the New Testament canon took a bloody turn. Emperor Diocletian determined to destroy Christian church property and sacred scripture. During this persecution, the sacred scriptures were seized and burned in public marketplaces. This persecution forced the Orthodox Church to seriously reevaluate the Gospels and Epistles that would be included in the New Testament. It is a serious matter when your life is threatened and you may die for your beliefs. It doesn't take long to determine which scripture is inspired. Eusebius was an eyewitness and historian to this final persecution of the entire Roman Empire by Diocletian. He placed in the canon of the New Testament the Gospels, Acts, and Paul's epistles, including Hebrews. Eusebius's disputed books did not differ much from the list provided by Origen. Toward the middle of the 4th century, repeated efforts were made to put an end to the uncertainty of the New Testament. Anthenaeus published a list of books considered to be of divine inspiration, and that list is the 27 books that comprise the New Testament today. He wrote, These are the wells of salvation, so that he who thirsts may be satisfied with the sayings in these. Let no one add to these, let nothing be taken away. The Synod of Hippo in 393 AD ratified the same list of the 27 books of the New Testament. With this ratification, the debate in the West was coming to an end. The Council of Carthage in 397 AD gives a list of the same 27 books and made the following decree that aside from the canonical scriptures nothing is to be read in the church under the name 
of divine scriptures. These two councils pretty much ended the New Testament canonical debate. But the advance of Christianity under Emperor Constantine did much to bring the disputed books in the East into acceptance. The Emperor Constantine gave Eusebius the task to prepare 50 copies of the Divine Scriptures. And this task established a standard in the East that gave recognition to all the doubtful books. In the West, Jerome and Augustine were the two principal agents that settled the canon. The publication of the Latin Vulgate by Jerome virtually ended the debate. Did the early church fathers ban books from the Bible? The answer to this question is yes. There were several books that were rejected during the canonical process, and these books were authored by the Gnostic heretical sect. Gnosticism is Greek myth merged with Orthodox Christianity and this corruption polluted the true gospel taught by Jesus Christ and his disciples. Many Gnostic teachers claim to have secret knowledge imparted to them by a particular disciple who alone was the true interpreter of the divine message. Since the accepted collection of apostolic epistles and gospels did not support these Gnostic assertions, these heretical groups were forced to author their own unique Gospels nearly 200 years after the ministry of Jesus Christ. In 1945, 12 leather-bound papyrus codices were found near the upper Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi that comprised a collection of Gnostic writings. Chief among these Gnostic works is the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip. Dr. Norman Geisler addressed the authorship of these Gnostic works in his book When Skeptics Ask. He wrote, these were not written by the apostles, but by men in the second century and later, pretending to use apostolic authority to advance their own teachings. Today, we call this fraud and forgery. The Gnostic Gospels caused considerable controversy, but were instrumental in the development of the New Testament canon. Were these writings ever considered during the canonical process? The answer is yes. Origen wrote in the first homily on Luke 1.1, I know a certain gospel, which is called the gospel according to Thomas, and a gospel according to Mattathias, and many others have we read. Nevertheless, among all of these, we have approved solely what the church has recognized, which is that only the four gospels should be accepted. Eusebius, who was commissioned by Emperor Constantine to prepare 50 copies of the divine scriptures, wrote, such books as the gospels of Peter, of Thomas, of Mattathias, or of any others beside them, and the Acts of Andrew and John and the other apostles. They clearly show themselves to be the fictions of heretics. Wherefore, they are not to be placed even among the rejected writings, but are all of them to be cast aside as absurd and impious. 
Yes, the Gnostic Gospels were considered by the apologists and bishops, but rejected as the fraudulent works of heretics. And according to the words of Eusebius, these works were absurd and impious. Recently, some scholars have challenged the reliability of the Bible because it is believed by some scholars to have evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. Should these assertions be true, then how reliable is the Bible we have today? How do we know that the Bible has been accurately translated from the original? There is a field of study in textual criticism known as bibliography that is concerned with identification and removal of errors from text. A bibliographer will trace the textual transmission of documents in use today to determine their accuracy to the original writings. In order to make these evaluations, three issues must be considered by the bibliographer. The number of copies currently in existence, the time interval between the original and the existing copies, and the degree of accuracy of the copies compared to the original manuscripts. Josh McDowell, in his book, The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, wrote that there are currently 5,686 handwritten Greek New Testament manuscript copies, 10,000 copies of the Latin Vulgate, and 9,300 copies of the New Testament in other languages. For a total of 24,970 manuscript copies of portions of the New Testament that exist today. The greater number of copies that exist will reduce the chance for textual error. For example, there are only 10 copies of the writings of Plato, 643 copies of Homer's Iliad, and eight copies of Herodotus' history that survived from Greek antiquity. From the Roman world, there are only 10 copies of the Gaelic Wars written by Julius Caesar. In comparison, there are currently 5,686 handwritten Greek New Testament manuscripts to work from. The question I have is simply this. When bibliographers measure the accuracy of the Bible, based on the number of copies, do they use the same measuring rod to determine the accuracy of other works that have survived from antiquity? When evaluating manuscripts, the shorter the time difference between the earliest manuscript copies and the original documents is better because there is less chance for the manuscript copy to undergo additions and scribal errors. For example, the works of Plato were written around 400 BC with the earliest copies dating to around 900 AD. This constitutes a time span of nearly 1300 years. Homer's Iliad was written about 800 BC with the earliest copy dating to around 400 BC, a time span of nearly 400 years. The history written by Herodotus was penned in 425 BC, with the earliest copy also dating to around 900 AD, a span of 1,350 years. While Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars was written in 50 BC, the earliest copy also dates to around 900 AD, a span of nearly 1,000 years. Do these same long time spans exist in the copies we have of the New Testament? John Ryland's fragment of John chapter 18, verse 31 through 33, and John 18, verse 37 through 38, was carbon-14 dated to between 110 and 150 A.D. This fragment dates to only one generation from the original manuscript. There is also the Bodmeyer Papyrus, a collection of approximately 50 Greek and Coptic manuscripts of the Old and New Testament that date between 150 and 200 AD. Major portions of these copies are nearly identical to Codex Vaticanus. The Chester B.D. Papyrus dates around 
225 AD. And this collection contains the Gospels, Acts, Paul's epistles, and Revelation. The Codex Sinaiticus dates to around 340 AD, and this collection contains half of the Old Testament books and all the New Testament except a few verses such as Mark 16, 9 through 20, and John 7, 53 through 8, 11. The Codex Vaticanus dates to around 330 AD and contains almost the entire Bible. It is possible that this codex was part of the 50 copies produced by Eusebius in response to the request of Emperor Constantine. When we understand that the New Testament was written between 50 and 100 AD, it's amazing to realize that the earliest fragments we have date between 25 and 50 years from the original documents. It's also equally amazing that we have complete copies of the entire New Testament dating only 225 years from the original manuscripts. When bibliographers measure the accuracy of the Bible based on the time interval between the original manuscripts and the current copies, do they use the same measuring rod to determine the accuracy of other works that have survived from antiquity? Now that we have considered the number of New Testament copies available and the short time span from these copies to the original manuscripts, we must also consider the textual accuracy of our Bible today compared with these early copies. Bibliographers today are virtually certain of 98% of the New Testament when compared with over 25,000 New Testament manuscripts. The lower criticism debate is centered on only 2% of the New Testament, with one and two word variants allowed for spelling and English clarification. Bishop Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort made the following statement in their book, The New Testament in the Original Greek, Volume 1. If comparative trivialities, such as changes of order, the insertion or omission of the the article with proper names and the like are set aside, the words in our opinion still subject to doubt can hardly amount to more than one thousandth part of the New Testament. A.T. Robertson suggests in his book, An Introduction to the Textual Criticism of the New Testament, that the real concern of textual criticism is of a one thousandth part of the entire text. Professor Keith Elliott and Ian Moore in The Manuscripts and the Text of the New Testament says, Most modern textual critics can agree on the bulk of the text, some 95% of it perhaps. It is the remaining 5% or so where disputes occur and differing conclusions may be found. How accurate is our Bible? According to modern textual critics, our Bible is between 95 and 98% accurate to the original manuscripts. When we combine the amount of copies, the time interval between the original manuscripts and the first copies, and the degree of accuracy of these documents, then we can only form one conclusion. Our New Testament is a near-perfect representation of what was written by the first apostles. Who is Yeshua ben Joseph? Was he simply a revolutionary executed by the Romans? Was he the Jewish Messiah? Is he Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One? Or is he the firstborn Son of God? Is it possible Jesus is all the above? The 27 books of the New Testament have answered these questions. We have four biographies, four Gospels that vividly portray Jesus as the Christ, the firstborn Son of God. 
the one thing Jesus is not. He is not a myth. The historical writings of Tacius and Josephus clearly show that Jesus did exist and that he was executed by Pontius Pilate. These non-biblical sources only confirm the basic elements of the four Gospels. These four books of the New Testament can be trusted as historical biographies. We can trust the testimony of the chronicled life of Jesus Christ. Jesus is much more than an executed revolutionary. He came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, a message of hope and goodwill. What we know of Jesus Christ can be found in the four Gospels that chronicle his life, death, and resurrection. The testimony of these four Gospels scream loudly for an answer. Did Jesus really exist? Did he perform the miracles noted in these four Gospels? Did Jesus rise from the dead? These four Gospels demand an answer.